Welcome to the AFJ Online Healthcare Classroom. I'm Jeff Cota, the Managing Editor of American Ferries Journal. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. We'll begin the webinar in just a moment, but first let me get a few announcements out of the way. This presentation will run about 40 minutes or so. After that, we'll have a Q&A session. If you look on the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a tab for questions. You can submit questions throughout the webinar and we'll go through as many as possible at the end. If you experience any technological issues, such as audio or with the display, and I don't interrupt the present presenter about the problem, the issue is likely on your end. In case of technical issues, call the GoToWebinar helpline. Get a pen or pencil ready and I'll give you that number to call. They'll be able to troubleshoot your problem and are very quick to respond specific to your machine and internet connection. If you're in the US, that number is 800-263 6317. If you are in any other country, the number is 1 805 617 7000. Again, if you're in the US, it's 800 263 6317. And if you're outside of the US, the number is 1 805 617 7,000. If the webinar session crashes, re-enter the webinar through the same link that brought you here. If it crashed for all of us, I'll relaunch the session and wait a few minutes for everyone to rejoin. Then we'll pick up where, we, where the presenter left off. Sponsoring tonight's webinar is Farnham. Farnham offers an ever-expanding range of equine necessities, including fly control, deworming, grooming, hoof and leg care products, wound care treatments, leather care, and stable supplies and supplements. Farnham remains focused on developing innovative products that are easy to use and make life better for you and your horse. For more information, visit Farnham.com. So with that, let's begin the webinar. Dr. Godby, thanks for joining us and take us away. Jeff, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank everybody that's on the call. Uh, I want to thank the American Farriers Journal for hosting this. Uh, hopefully, we'll all be able to get something out of this, me learning from your questions and, and you learning from what we're going to go over. Uh, some 423 years ago, William Shakespeare wrote a play in, in which the horse was mentioned predominantly. And so, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. And and I know the way you make your living, and, and uh, I show cutting horses, and I have one of the best farriers on the planet that... Uh, I would not do anything in the world to lose, and, and so I'll make sure I send him his checks immediately. We want to keep him paid, but no foot, no horse. And, and this goes without saying that it is oftentimes a neglected area by uh, novice horse owners uh, that need your guidance. And, and so the more knowledge that you have, especially as it relates to nutrition, uh, the better the ultimately we help the horse and I, I think that's all of our goal uh, whether uh, uh, we're in the nutrition side the veterinary side uh, the farrier trainer uh, etc so what are our goals this evening uh, first thing is it's not about trimming or shoeing I am not a farrier uh, I know enough to be exceptionally dangerous to my horses and I said I have, I have a fantastic uh, farrier we're going to talk a little bit about normal hoof growth and physiology, which each one of you, I'm sure, uh, will know more about than, than I do. Uh, discuss nutrients required for normal uh, hoof growth, and we're going to uh, uh, spend a little bit of time on that. And, and where do these nutrients uh, start? I mean, where can we get these as far as the diet goes? I think each one of us understands that through uh, evolution, this horse is, is down now where He's literally running on his middle fingernail. Uh, think about the concussive force that starts uh, when this foot strikes the ground as it comes up these, these uh, uh, bony columns and, and the amount of concussion that has to be absorbed. Uh, so if we can take some of this, obviously, in the, the flexibility and uh, in this foot, uh, we decrease the amount that comes up and ultimately uh, it, it'll obviously help us keep these horses uh, sound longer. So what causes poor hoof growth or quality? The one thing is age. We know with some of these older horses, one, they're not as, as adept in uh, uh, absorbing nutrients and, and uh, 
So sometimes we can be a little bit shorter on our nutrients. We know that uh, the gut microbiome on these horses change. Uh, this is where a lot of the biotin, uh, as far as uh, in a normal diet, these horses have obtain biotin from the microbial synthesis in the large gut. Uh, we know genetics makes a huge difference. Uh, I'm sure each one of you have had horses that you've been out there to to uh, uh, shoe, and and no matter what you do, it, the, the horse continues to have these issues, whether it's flaky feet or, or uh, uh, cracks, where they're quarter cracks, uh, you know, whatever that is, it's, it's a genetic issue, and we see it sometimes in bloodlines. We see it sometimes it, that are uh, more so in certain breeds than in others. Environmental conditions, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that because uh, it's interesting when we get to talking about moisture and in, in, in the environment. But hard concussive ground, uh, where we've got, uh, where I live, I live in North Scottsdale, Arizona. I have a lot of decomposed granite. Uh, it does wear away feet uh, more so than last week I was in uh, South Louisiana. Uh, I don't think they have anything in wear away your feet down there. So the environment does have a uh, a major impact on not only the the, the growth and and uh, uh, but also on the quality, the management. Uh, you know, I'm sure if you could get uh, all of your customers and uh, to to uh, have you out every six to eight weeks, that would uh, uh, that would make everybody's life a lot better in, in this horse. But we know people that they don't keep up with that. Uh, they don't pay attention to, to how often they clean their stalls. They, they let these stalls, you know, get uh, get high in ammonia uh, where we've got the urine in there. And, and so we have a lot of degradation as far as this hoof goes uh, in that aspect. And I put nutrition down here last, although oftentimes it's usually thrown up as the first thing. And so let's talk a little bit about how does nutrition impact the foot, and in reality, how do we feed the hoof? You have to feed the horse. There are some great products on the market. I mean, fantastic. Really smart people put these products together. Uh, and no matter you know how, how good they are, no one has methionine or biotin for, for, for two, the, two of the nutrients that we t go talk a good bit about. No one has one that tells the, that biotin, hey, today you're supposed to go to the hoof. Now, tomorrow, I understand you're going to be involved in the skin. But th today, you know, it, 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 we're worried about the hoof, so I need you to go down there and the same thing with, with methionine. So what you have to do is you have to do a little sleuthing. You have to be able to do some arithmetic. And, and it's, it's not very difficult. I think most, most of us can do add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And so what we need to do uh, uh, is, is what are we feeding? You know, and I know you get asked this question, what, what, what supplement should I use? And rather than giving them an, a, an immediate answer, we need to stop and think about what is this horse? What are we looking at? I mean, if we've got a horse standing out there and he's a body condition score of three or four, uh, he's not worried about his feet. He's worried about being here tomorrow. Uh, so so we, we need to have a good idea of, of what we're looking at before we just start willy-nilly making a recommendation of, of whatever product to use. And, and uh, so we need to have an idea of how much, are there, how much water are these horses drinking, and we're going to talk about that. How much energy uh, are they consuming? Obviously, if a horse has a body condition score of three or four, odds are he's energy deficient. Oftentimes, we'll have a horse that's a body condition score of, let's say, seven, six, seven, eight, and maybe even a nine, which is an obese horse, that uh, is getting sufficient amount of energy, but he's deficient in a vitamin or a mineral or a protein that, that could impact uh, the quality of that hoof. So what is required? How much water do they need? How much energy do they need? Protein, minerals, and vitamins. And, and for a minute or two, we'll, we'll just kind of go through that. An average horse will consume 8 to 10 gallons of water per day for maintenance alone. Uh, obviously, in hotter weather, exercise, et cetera, can go up uh, uh, two, three, four times this amount. 80% of the moisture in the hoof is supplied internally. So the first thing that tells you is that painting something on the outside is not going to add a great deal of moisture to it. And we're going to talk a good bit more about this and a little bit later on on a couple of uh, research papers. Uh, so, um, 
Then, and, and, and the hoof wall can be as high as, as 50% uh, hoof wall moisture. Uh, and, and it's interesting as, as, as you go through and you look at these different papers, uh, the way they determine moisture has a great impact on, on the amount of moisture that they're finding. Whether they, they, they use trimmings and they, they let it dry air dryer or they put it in an oven, it tends to make a difference. Well, energy is the greatest need as far as most horses go on a daily basis. And the two ways that we get energy in horses for the most part, one is carbohydrates, starches and sugars. And I know starches and sugars have, have a bad, uh, bad connotation in the horse world uh, because we have done a great job of telling people to be scared of starches and sugars because you'll end up with a metabolic or an insulin resistant horse or something along these lines. And we've gone too far because now we are not feeding enough carbs that we can get uh, muscle glycogen replenishment on these these multiple day uh, where these horses are worked hard. Uh, we've got now where we use a lot of fats and oils, uh, and, and most of these are going to be vegetable oils. Uh, there's some that, that that are using like microalgae oil. Uh, some of the fish oils and, and things along these lines that give us something called EPA and DHA. But for the most part, we use vegetable oils and we have two things called essential fatty acids and these must be in the diet. The horse cannot synthesize these. He can synthesize everything else. These two must be supplied in the diet. And one is linoleic, and that's an omega-6 fatty acid, and the other is linolenic, which is, is an omega-3 fatty acid. And you, you know about the anti-inflammatory uh, aspects of them, energy density, et cetera. One of the things that we have gotten a greater interest in now is something called ceramides. And ceramides are, are, are uh, uh, specific uh, fats that form a raft, if you will, or if you stop and take your fingers and interlace them, uh, you, you make a, literally a dam that decreases moisture loss uh, both from the hoof and the skin. And uh, ceramides are, are, are uh, they really started coming into vogue with the real expensive uh, 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 cosmetics. Uh, you see them in a great many of the real high dollar cosmetics uh, and most of the products that are, that, uh, that are used in Japan are very high in ceramides and, and they do decrease this moisture loss uh, uh, from the skin and from the uh, and from the hoof wall itself. An energy deficiency, uh, you know, we go back to this this horse that's that's uh, a low body condition score. Energy deficiency will will slow or stop hoof growth completely. I mean, it's it is not one of the the, the critical things in this horse's uh, uh, as far as his physiology goes in the short term. The stratum medium is composed of 15% of free fatty acids. So if we decrease this, this fatty acid intake, we, in, we impact or decrease the quality of the stratum medium. And we all know that a sudden uh, access to excess energy, primarily in the form of carbohydrates, uh, we get a laminitic episode. In certain horses, it can be fructans. As far as the grass is going, we end up with the same problem. Protein, this is the one thing that, that it seems like uh, in the horse world, we get hung up on protein and, and many people confuse energy with protein. And you've heard I can't feed that 16% that protein or 14% protein feed to my horse, it, it whacks them out and, and it's not really the protein, it's probably the energy. But there's 10 essential amino acids uh, and, and they're easy to remember, it's something called Matt Hill VP. And it's methionine, arginine, threonine, tryptophan, histidine, isoleucine, leucine, valine, and phenylalanine. But the requirements, are, there's so many things that can change this. You know, the age of the horse. Uh, that older horse, the quality of the protein probably needs to be closer to the quality of the protein for these, these young growing horses, the, the weanling and yearling. Uh, work doesn't have a great influence in the uh, percent of protein. Uh, the amount of protein will go up because you're going to feed more, more feed. Uh, uh, production as far as reproduction, the, the last trimester of gestation, 
70 to 80 percent of fetal development can have a definite impact. Uh, early lactation uh, can have an impact, but uh, energy is uh, affected much more by production than is protein. Protein quality is paramount when we get to talking about hoof formation. So we look for things like soybean meal that, that has a, a, a real strong, uh, a really good balance of amino acids. Uh, we talk about the biological value. Uh, soybean meal is, is uh, it's, uh, uh, very palatable. Uh, protein addition may improve the uh, growth and quality, but gelatin does not. I mean, I, I, I have up here, this is an amino acid analysis of gelatin, and, and we know that methionine is, is critical in this hoof growth, the sulfur containing amino acid. And we look at uh, typical gelatin has 0.7% methionine. Uh, you know, it's high in arginine, it's good in lysine, but as far as methionine, which is going to make a, a very positive impact, gelatin is not going to get the job done. So we, we're going to minerals, and as we go, we've gone through these, we've kind of gone in, in what's needed in the greater abundance. You know, we started talking about energy, then protein, now minerals, and the macro minerals are calcium, uh, phosphorus, and this phospholipids is important because phospholipids is, is, is uh, extremely important in cell membrane integrity. And this is where that ceramide starts to enter the, the picture. Sodium is obviously important in acid-base balance and osmotic regulation. Same thing for potassium. Sulfur is a nutrient component of the hoof wall itself. Uh, anybody that's ever branded uh, cattle or horses, uh, they, they uh, are, didn't do a good job of starting up their grill. Uh, you know, when you've kind of singed some hair, you, you, you get that sulfur smell. The micro minerals, one is zinc, and it's important in cellular reproduction and, and uh, also for the enzyme function or synthesis. We need zinc as, as, a, as a cofactor in a lot of our energy, uh, energy use and metabolism. Copper is important in collagen formation and extremely important in disulfide bond formation. And we'll talk about why that's important here in just a minute. Then we have manganese, cobalt, selenium, iron, and iodine. Now, the importance of sulfur, and, and this, is, this is why methionine and biotin are so important as, as we uh, grow these hooves and, and try and get a quality hoof that we, that we can go back in every six weeks or eight weeks or whatever we need to do and have some room that we can put, uh, put nail holes in. Uh, methionine is a self-containing amino acid, and you can see it here. Methionine can be converted to cysteine uh, in the body and cysteine is converted to cysteine, and we get a disulfide bond. And you can see that on the right, uh, where you got a sulfur to sulfur, and you can see it down at the bottom, uh, where you see it right, a uh, uh, disulfide group. Biotin is a sulfur-containing B vitamin, and it gives us something called a sulfhydryl bond. And the sulfhydryl bond is very important for pliability. It probably has a lot more impact on uh, uh, the frog of the foot than it does on the hoof wall um, as far as the sulfhydryl bond. The disulfide bond is where we get strength and, and, and rigidity. Mineral effect on hoof formation. Uh, Akami in 99 uh, did a study where low zinc and copper intake increased white line disease. It's why we go back and we can just do some arithmetic and say, oh, okay. You know, uh, we've got plenty of, of copper and, and, and zinc in this diet. Uh, doctors Ott and Johnson down at the University of Florida, uh, they fed proteinated zinc, copper, and manganese and increased hoof growth 4%. So these are things that you start looking for when you, when you look at a quality uh, uh, hoof product or uh, any type of ration for the uh, diet for these horses. Chronic excess uh, dietary selenium ties up sulfur. Uh, this is the reason we get hooves sloughing off, we get the, the hair in the mane and tail uh, uh, breaking, uh, is that uh, selenium has, has, has replaced sulfur in some of these. The more disulfide bonds we have within this, this uh, uh, structure, the harder the hoof is. So, you know, it, this is why uh, it's important that we can get the, the methionine in there 
and we don't end up with horses with really dry feet, and I'll tell you that in just a few minutes. One of the things is everybody has seen this uh, selenium uh, uh, soil content, uh, and you can see the northeast and the northwest, and then the, uh, down along the mid-Atlantic down, and then into Florida, and then some even over where I live. We have sel selenium deficient areas. The thing about selenium, I think, is that everybody puts it in their, their feeds today. Uh, a huge percentage of the supplements that people are feeding have selenium. So in, in some respects, I get more concerned about selenium toxicosis than I do the selenium deficiency. Uh, that's why most of these products that are target type supplements, as hoof, hoof supplements should be, uh, you won't find uh, selenium in very many of them because general vitamin mineral supplements have selenium. Uh, all the horse feeds everybody's feeding has got added selenium in them, and for the most part, uh, they're maxed out. So uh, we'll talk about uh, the fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, vitamin A is important for epithelial tissue formation. Uh, a vitamin A deficiency, we oftentimes see inflammation of the coronary band. Uh, vitamin D is important in calcium metabolism, uh, obviously extremely important in bone uh, formation as well as muscle uh, activity. Uh, uh, so we've got to have our calcium. Vitamin E is an antioxidant. It's important for cell membrane integrity. Anytime that we start free radicals just kind of running amok in, in the body, uh, we start damaging DNA. And damaged DNA uh, comes about from a lot of times from broken down uh, membrane integrity. And, and, and uh, uh, as these horses age, we see a greater uh, effect of uh, uh, free radical damage uh, that's accumulated over time. Uh, older horses don't uh, aren't able to uh, um, uh, get the immune response that a younger horse can. So vitamin E can be important in that. The water-soluble vitamins, vitamin's the one that, that uh, we talk about in horse products all the time. It's important in cell to, uh, to cell adhesion, this binding, or this intracellular cementing of, of these, these uh, tubules uh, into, the, uh, into the matrix, matrix it, itself. Other B vitamins, uh, for the most part, B vitamins are extremely important in energy metabolism. We go back and we have an energy deficiency. We decrease uh, hoof growth. We, we have a negative impact on the stratum medium. Uh, so we want to make sure we're getting enough, not only the energy in there, but the things in there that help the energy to be utilized. Uh, vitamin C is important in collagen and elastin. Uh, you know, when we get to talking about that foot, it's not just the hoof wall that we need to have some concern on. We need to be uh, cognizant of the internal structure uh, where we're talking about uh, ligaments and tendons, uh, and, and uh, how important the collagen and elastin is in that formation. So this, uh, uh, th this next part is specifically talking about biotin. It uh, is in chronological order from 1984 on forward, and uh, because I want, uh, there's so much discussion out there of how much biotin does this horse need? Does he need X amount, Y amount, whatever it is? And we'll just go through this, and, and these, these are refereed publications. Uh, the data is duplicable. One of the issues in some of these are uh, there's a relatively low number of horses in some of them, so that's, that can be a hit on it. But Comden in 84 uh, fed thoroughbreds 15 uh, milligrams per day, draft horses, 16, 1,700-pound horses about 30 milligrams a day for five months. They saw a thickener, thicker and harder hoof horn. Uh, took an additional four months, so nine months total. The shoeing was easier and lasted longer. Well, that's about the time we'd see that hoof completely grow out. Uh, a German study that Winsor did in 86 reported improved hoof horn quality in warm bloods and trotters. Biotin was fed at about 1.8 milligrams per 100 pounds, or about 20 milligrams for an 1,100 pound horse. So make a little note, 20 milligrams. So we're at 15 milligrams, we're at 20 now for that 1,100 pound horse. 
this is some work that was done using scan, uh, scanning electron microscopy of the trimmings from brittle feet. Uh, what they were doing, this, this was a study that was done. It, is a, uh, uh, it was a case study in the United Kingdom. And one of the issues that they ran into, uh, they saw a loss of structure and horn in the stratum externum. See, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, holes with the loss of the tubular structure. They corrected this with 15 grams of, uh, 15 milligrams, I'm sorry, of supplemental biotin over nine months. That should be 15 milligrams, not 15 grams. Uh, biotin over nine months. Then they did another horse and they, they found that they had a poor attachment of the horn uh, uh, flaking in the stratum medium failed to respond to 20 milligrams of biotin per day for six months. And then they went back and added calcium carbonate, seven and a half grams a day for a relatively small amount. After nine months of supplementation, the structure improvement was noticed. The second horse in this, this, this where they added the calcium carbonate, was a horse that, that was fed a great deal of bran, wheat bran, uh, over in England. And if you remember back, uh, we have something called Miller's disease or secondary nutritional hyperparathyroidism is the big word we went to school to learn. Uh, and, and what happens is, is uh, back in the day when uh, the uh, wheat, you know, the flour mills would, would feed their brand to their horses, they ended up pulling a lot of calcium out of the skull. And we got this, quote, big head disease. Well, that's what they were running into here. So the, the horses were calcium deficient. So when they added the calcium with the 20 milligrams of biotin, uh, they saw uh, an improvement in the structure. And uh, this is some 87 data. And here is a, uh, uh, the scanning electron microscopy uh, and where you can see the stratum internum, the stratum medium, and you see these holes with the loss of the tubular structure. And this, uh, the scanning mic uh, micrograph on the right shows these uh, tubular, uh, the tubular structure that's been filled back in uh, after they fed the uh, calcium carbonate, along with the 20 milligrams of biotin. In 91, Fritzsche and others looked at biotin on hoof quality, and they looked at the effect on epidermal cell differentiation. Uh, and they found that with uh, uh, additional biotin, that they improve this differentiation, and, and that's where these these cells start to to, to mature as they go uh, from the internal to the external part of this hoof wall. Buffin 92 uh, had treatments of zero, seven and a half milligrams, 15 milligrams per day, or 15 milligrams per day on alternate months. They fed it for 10 months. They saw an improvement and growth and hardness on all, uh, all the treatments, they found the best results at 15 milligrams per day. So again, we've got 15 milligrams and 20 milligrams, and that seems, uh, at least through here, to, to be the numbers that we need to be, to be targeting. This is a study everyone uh, in the supplement world, and I don't know, and, and who all else's world, they talk about 20 milligrams per day, this was over a three-year study. This was with the Lipizzan horses uh, in Austria. It took six months to see an appreciable difference. It took nine months for a significant difference. And on some horses, it took over a year. They did not find any growth difference in uh, uh, 28 days, but the quality of the hoof uh, did improve, uh, held shoes better, and it maintained it over three years of observation. So this is the 20 milligram that's, that in some respects, I guess, is a quote, holy grail. Uh, it's just adding again to, to the 15 to 20 milligrams. Uh, in 96, there was a study done where uh, they did, uh, they did uh, uh, some smaller horses, 15, uh, eight to 15 months improved the horn condition. Uh, the thing that, they, that was interesting on this, 70% of the horses, when you quit supplementing uh, 20 milligrams per day to these horses, uh, they they went backwards. The quality of the hoof uh, deteriorated. So uh, this this was one of those kind of studies that that shows that yes, it was the, the biotin in there that was making a difference. Uh, 
this was a study done in 98 on some matched pairs of ponies. Uh, essentially, uh, 0.05 milligrams per pound. That's going to be about 20 uh, milligrams in 1,100-pound horse. They looked at it for five months, and they saw a 15% improvement in the rate of growth and in the amount of growth. So it, uh, it grew faster and we ended up with more of it, but they didn't look at anything that had to do with quality. Phenylalanine is an amino acid. It's an essential amino acid. And oftentimes, we don't ever think about that. We're, we get, we're so programmed, if you will, to think about methionine and, and, and biotin. But phenylalanine is part of this protein matrix, and, and this alpha helix, which is making up the tubules themselves, it is embedded in this protein matrix. And so phenylalanine is converted to tyrosine, and as you can see here, tyrosine is part of the protein matrix, and, and you can see uh, the alpha helix, how it ties into it. So oftentimes it's, it's pretty, you know, I, I, on certain products, I probably would look for phenylalanine. Ceramides, they're intracellular lipids. And intracellular means that they, they're inside the cells themselves. They're, they're within the cell walls. They form these rafts that minimize moisture loss. And they contribute to the intracellular adhesion of keratinocytes. So ceramides are something that, uh, at least of the last few years, that, that we have a greater idea of what impact it can have on the hoof and the hoof wall uh, quality. And this just gives you an idea of the keratinocytes. Uh, you can see these uh, intracellular lipids or these rafts and how it holds the moisture into the, the hoof wall. Water or hydration. In, in 1885, Zotke uh, did a study where he looked at the proximal wall and found 28.8% water. He looked at the distal wall, 28.5% water. Well, we did a lot in roughly a hundred, little over 100 years. Spitzley found 28% moisture in the hoof wall. Uh, this is a study that was done with Chris Pollock's group down with the Brumbies in, in uh, Australia. And they looked at horses from three different environments. Uh, there were 40 horses in this study. But they looked at a wet and boggy. They looked at a partially wet. And they looked at a desert. And what they found uh, as far as hoof wall moisture on these horses was 29.6 for the wet and boggy, 29.5 for the partially wet, the horse that was wet and dry, wet and dry, and 29.5 for the horse that was in the desert. So the environment did not have a great impact whatsoever on the hoof wall moisture. Then they took some quarter horses and they soaked the foot for two hours. And what they found was the the sole moisture was changed when they soaked them for two hours or over two hours, but the hoof wall moisture had no effect whatsoever. Is that a good thing? You know, I, I know that uh, out here sometimes we, we let our water trials uh, overflow where the horses are in a little bit of moisture. Uh, we're not impacting the hoof wall moisture based on all the data, but we're sure impacting the soul. And, and, and so we soften these soles uh, does that increase uh, uh, bruising? Does it increase uh, abscesses? Uh, is there a point where there's too much moisture in, the, in that sole itself? So I put up there, good, yes, no, I, and I, I, I don't know. Uh, that I've not seen any data on it. I just know that the softer that sole is, the greater chance we have for some bruising and the greater chance uh, definitely we see uh, where we get some abscesses. And this is Hampson's Works, Chris Pollock's group down in Australia, 2012. This was using some uh, nuclear magnetic resonance and, and some British uh, researchers looked at the effect of hydration on hoof keratin. And what they normal hoof has uh, disulfide bonds between the cysteine residues and the stratum externum. And this is what we talked about earlier where we get these disulfide bonds from methionine going to cysteine as a cysteine makes cysteine, we get the disulfide bonds. And what they found was as this, this as the foot dried, the disulfide bonds were broken down. So that loosened the alpha helix and it decreased the quality of that, that hoof wall itself. So the side chains of this keratin were less mobile, making the foot more rigid, increased rigidity, 
uh, may make the foot less able to absorb stresses or absorb the concussive force. This was some uh, O3 work that Durer did uh, uh, over in England. Everybody I know knows uh, the great amount of blood flow and, and uh, blood vessels that are in the foot. Uh, this the, I use this and I show this to horse owners a lot. And, and, and once they see this, they're amazed at the amount of blood that's, that's going and coming down in this foot. So what, what do we look for? What are some things that, that, that you as, as a farrier uh, who, who is really helping these, these, uh, these horse owners? Uh, things to look for is lysinemethionine content. Uh, you come down and then here's obviously the biotin content. So it's 25 milligrams of biotin, somewhere around three and a half milligrams or three and a half uh, grams for 3,600 milligrams, three and a half grams of methionine. This one happens to have some phenylalanine in it, the omega-3 and 6 fatty acids. We talked about why they're important. Uh, you come down and look at the ingredients and see see the source of these ingredients because oftentimes that is better uh, a better indicator of of, uh, of what you're getting than the guaranteed analysis. I think most horse owners have gotten that where they spend a lot of time learning something about uh, uh, the 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 labels and how to read the labels, but uh, the more we can help them and the more we can teach them, ultimately, uh, the better off the, these horses are going to be. Too much B vitamins, most of our nutrients, excess vitamin makes really, really expensive urine. Uh, I've seen products out there on the market that's 100 milligrams of pure biotin. I have yet to see a study anywhere in the literature that says that does anything other than make real, real high high dollar urine. So uh, in reality, you know, we need to be uh, uh, in that 20 to 25 milligrams of, of biotin. So the take home message, hoof growth is slow. I mean, you, I'm, I'm telling y'all something that, that you already know, half to three eighths of an inch per month. But the most important thing that, that I hope you can get out of here, one of the things is you gotta feed the whole horse. Nobody has a supplement that has methionine and biotin and lysine and phenylalanine and calcium, phosphorus, zinc, copper, yada, yada, that you can whisper to it and say, go to the foot, go to the foot, my friend. It won't happen. These horses have got to be fed a balanced diet. And then we start seeing some, some, some improvements on, on uh, uh, the use of quality hoof supplements. The other thing to remember is, is, is it takes, you know, a joint product, if you're not seeing a difference in about 30 days, it may not work. Well, a hoof product's gonna take considerably longer than that. And remember, if a little is good, a lot's not always better. Uh, we can make some really expensive urine. Most important thing, you can't change genetics. You know, and like in racing, running horses, if, if a horse genetically can't outrun a fat man, you can't make him outrun a fat man unless you get a slower fat man. So you just can't change the genetic aspect of these horses. Well, let's see, Jeff, that's right at about 38 minutes. So uh, thank you all so much for, for spending some time with us this evening. Uh, we thank American Fairs Journal for for allowing us to do this. Uh, and uh, so Jeff, I guess we'll I'll, uh, open it up to you. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, you had talked about uh, soy a few moments ago or earlier in the uh, webinar. And we have a uh, question from New York, uh, wondering whether the soy needs to be cooked in order to, for it to be digested. Yeah, one of the things, and you're right, uh, soybean, soybeans have a trypsin inhibitor. So when we heat, heat soybeans and, and doing that through crushing to get the oil or whether, whether we're doing it through uh, uh, the pellet mill or ever how we're doing it, we're heating it because it does, it has a trypsin inhibitor. That's a great question. Just going and buying raw soybeans are not going to get anything accomplished. Okay, great. Um... Uh, question from Oregon. How would you feed a horse that has rotation of the coffin bone and a horse that has navicular disease with actual deterioration of the coffin bone? That one might be tough. Wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the one, the, the uh, uh, 
the the lamb, I, I wrestled with the lamb Nick aspect with a gray starlight mare every day. You know, I, I, I the first thing that I would go back and look for is there. You know, work with the veterinarian and where we look at these bisphosphonates as far as is on these navicular horses. But there's some there's some products on the market that contain something sodium zeolite A. And if you look at the data from A and M and from Michigan State, Brian Nielsen's data, it showed that it helped build bone. Uh, and now whether it in the racehorse whether it was. Uh, uh going back and 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 helping with micro fractures uh bef before they became major issues or what uh no one determined it but uh Brian Nielsen had some good data on sodium zeolite A in bone bone formation and bone development i would definitely uh you know you got to have your calcium and phosphorus in there but oftentimes we we forget uh and, and on those horses, we've got to keep the weight off of them. I mean, that's that's so we we've got to keep that body condition score down and still get all the other nutrients in this horse. Uh, and, and so I mean, uh, other than that type of, of supplement that had had uh, some zeolite A in it, and and there's some other things that said they have zeolite. The only date I've ever saw, seen has been on zeolite A. Uh, you know, uh, make sure we've got that calcium phosphorus as, as close to two to three to one uh, as we can get. Uh, I would definitely use uh, chelated trace minerals if, uh, as well as, as, as regular inorganic trace minerals in, in that you can't get enough of zinc and copper and manganese just from the, the chelates. Um, you know, I, I like... It, it, uh, uh, it, that's a hard one. I mean, that's about as far as I can get in my head, you know, in a, in a minute or so. Okay, that's good. Thank you, sir. Um, we have an attendee in Oklahoma who is a farrier. Uh, he's having, or she is having, uh, major problems this year with Russian white line. Um, how do you convince customers that the health of the foot is not only related to conditions but to health? Oh wow! I, I, I mean, I. I can't imagine a horse owner that doesn't understand that that thrush and a lot of these things start uh, with management and taking care of that that foot, uh, and it pays dividends in the long run. Jeez, uh, I, I don't know. I uh, okay. How how do you convince them? Uh, you know. I, and, and sometimes you hate to do this, but sometimes it's, it's like in wounds. You talk about wound products. Sometimes it's good for someone to, to be shocked a little bit and say, "Wow, so that's like canker." I'm telling you that 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 hoof canker, that foot canker, to me is it, it, it would get my attention if my horse had it and and my farrier showed that to me and said, "You see what this can get to." You know, I teach a lot all over the country and and. Uh, Boy, that would sure get my attention, I think. Okay, good. Um, in Alabama, we have an attendee who says, uh, diet, who asks, uh, diet for a 20 year old foundered rodeo horse who uh, that has turned, been turned up for six months, um, for the six months that they've owned them. It's going to be stalled for two months, but they can't find the hay hay what other hay can they use in that situation you know you you get, you get and, and it was interesting when i was in uh, louisiana last week I, I have to go and give a lecture down in Folsom, louisiana to a big vet conference in uh in january and down there they feed a lot of bahia hay and there's nothing to it i mean and 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 down in uh, i'm originally from georgia I'm, I'm i'm a little familiar with with the kind of hays we have down there to feed um you know, unless you want to go uh, talk to your banker, you you, you almost uh, have to feed, you know, the best quality coastal you can get your hands on. Uh, but, you know, uh, again, um, you might can supplement that with, with some, some hay pellets, some alfalfa pellets to keep, you know, keep the, the energy content up on it uh, as far as the, the, the digestible energy. Um, 
the 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 key is uh, with him uh, with stall rest is to, to be careful of obesity and gaining too much weight. And and you can you can you know uh, you can find some really good quality uh, coastal. Um, that's 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 a hey if down there that's what I would be feeding. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, another question. What would you look for if you have a horse that has good body condition score, is well fed, and taking hoof supplements for several months, but still has poor hoof quality? Bad genetics. I mean, that's that, and, and I had a lady years and years ago call me, and, and she was asking me that same kind of question. And she'd used, I don't know how many different supplements she told me. She said her horse's feet's always crappy. I said, ma'am, you're not going to want to hear this, but your horse genetically has crappy feet. And she said, that's what everybody else tells me. Um, you know, it, 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 you probably are doing the very best. You probably have that horse's feet the best that, that, that they're ever going to get to be. So I would stay with the uh, the hoof supplement uh, because no telling how bad it'd be if you weren't on a good diet and using a good quality supplement and, and doing really great uh, farrier work on that horse keeping him trailed. Okay. Great. Thank you. We have a Florida farrier who works on a lot of horses with the tubulars showing and has chippy hooves. What can they, what can this farrier tell uh, their clients to look for in a feed? You know, uh, I, I would go back and, and depending on the age of the horse and, and stuff like that, as far as the protein goes, uh, you know, it's hard to find a feed company that's going to sell anything less than than uh, 10 or 12 percent protein, 11 percent protein. But your horse needs eight and a half percent protein, and they would never do that because no one would ever buy it. Uh, it, it and down in Florida, you know, your your hay choices, uh, your pastures, both are going to be uh, uh, some type of Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. Um, I think that. Uh, uh, one of the things that, that you could try down there, you know, we, we know we can't push moisture in to speak of from, from the, from the outside of that hoof. And, uh, I, I would, I, when we start seeing that chipping and that flaking, uh, oftentimes that's a, a little bit of a dehydration issue. You go back to, to one of the papers that, that we talked about here that they saw is that foot dried. They saw a breakdown of the, the, uh, Alpha helix are, are, are the strength of, of the, the hoof wall, and we saw that flaking. Uh, are they using an electrolyte? Are the horses? Are they? Do they know the horses is drinking really well? You know, just some of those basic management things. Uh, and and once you make sure that that you're comfortable with the really simple things to check, then we can go in a little more detail in everything. That makes sense. Yes, sir. Great, thank you. We have a horse owner from Virginia who has a 17-year-old uh, horse um, and uh, that has uh, paper-thin soles. Is there a nutritional element to uh, in the reasoning for the thin soles or is there something else going on there, do you think? I have never, never seen anything in the literature that would – that that the soul would be impacted like we can impact the hoof wall. Um, you know, you've got something, you've got different tissues. Uh, I, I honestly don't, I, I don't know of anything specifically that, that would, uh, that would make a difference there. Um, I, I, I don't have an answer. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. Great. Thank you, sir. Um, we have an attendee in Texas who has a question about a, a horse that has a split going up to the coronary band. And recently, the hoof wall seems to be lifting and peeling up where the split is. How can this uh, individual uh, feed the horse to strengthen its feet overall? Well, the, the first thing is, is kind of like you know, we talked about. Let's, let's kind of get an idea of what we are feeding. And, uh, you know, it, uh, and te I've got dear friends in Texas that work down at the, that work for A and M, and and uh, they'll they'll help you do the arithmetic and stuff to see what you're feeding, uh, and let's make sure we don't have a deficiency. 
uh, to me that I, I would I would I would prefer to do that on my horses before I'd run out and just start buying you know a, a hoof supplement and just get a basic idea because one of the things that that you're talking about you know we see this oftentimes with with trace mineral uh, deficiencies and, and zinc is one that comes to mind uh, I know Zenpro's had some some fairly good data on that on, on that. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another attendee in Wisconsin who is wondering about the benefits of flax and how much uh, should be fed. Great question. Flax is, flax is high in linolenic, uh, which is omega-3 fatty acid. Uh, there's a couple of downsides to flax. One is if you feed it whole, you will have the best looking birds in the neighborhood uh, because it'll pass through that horse and the birds will eat it and they'll get the benefit of the omega-3 fatty acid. Uh, you know, so you've got to grind it, uh, and once it's ground, uh, the, the, the omega-3 fatty acid, the linolenic, uh, oxidizes and goes rancid fairly quickly. So you either have to buy it uh, prepared, where they've got an antioxidant in it, or uh, you have to do it on a daily basis, which, you know, I mean, you can use a coffee grinder, and you know, I, I would, I would, in reality, feed somewhere two to four ounces. You know, there's people that'll feed half pound. Uh, when you start getting up to half pound and things like that, you're putting a lot of energy in that horse, and oftentimes uh, we end up with a horse that uh, where he was he was very controllable early, and we get this excess energy in him, and and uh, uh, he feels a little bit a uh, little bit frisky, a little more spry. Uh, so I'd, I'd be somewhere in that uh, two to four ounces and just kind of just uh, that's going to give you the, some anti-inflammatory aspects. It's going to improve the, the hair coat on this horse. Um, and and uh, I think you, you easily do that without uh, impacting the energy intake and, and uh, uh, his attitude. Great. Thank you. We have a question from Australia uh, where I've been there twice. I loved it. <laughs> um, the attendee says that uh, in Australia they don't have access to uh, all the hoof supplements or feeds that are available in the U.S. and Euro in Europe, um, and they're wondering how can they uh, source equivalent substitutes. Good question. I, I, yeah, I've, I've been in there twice and been blessed to lecture and, and see the country and and some of the, some dear dear friends down there now. Uh, it. it, it and then he's right. Their their feed is totally different. I mean, you look at their feed and you go, really? Um, I would, you know, to get the biotin and stuff, go go on the human side. Biotin's biotin. Uh, go on the human side as far as methionine. You can probably get that. Uh, uh, you can do the same thing on the uh, uh, the health food stores and things like that. Uh, you can find great sources uh, uh, that uh, uh, I just buy the biotin, but like uh, the, the methionine. Um, you know, you could, you could, uh, you could use some soybean, uh, meal, uh, you know, uh, and you can, you can find like, uh, DL methionine, uh, uh, in, in, in the health food stores. And this go back to about 20 milligrams a day, uh, of the, uh, the biotin and, and on the, 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 uh, methionine, well, I, if I'm going to supplement that, I want to be somewhere between that three and six uh, 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 grams per day additional uh, methionine over whatever's in the diet. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we have a, uh, the last question of the evening is from an attendee in Germany. And the Been attendee is... Three times. There you go. <laughs> Uh, they're wondering what would you recommend for growing new healthy hoof after an illness such as laminitis? Yeah, I, I, w I would want to find uh, a quality, again, go back to that, that diet. And, and, and a lot of the feeds I saw that they were feeding in Germany, uh, they, to me they looked a lot, a lot like bird seed in that there were a lot of grains and they hadn't been processed. Uh, so I know some of that's passing through this horse, but if you can find a, uh, and they've got some great quality supplements over there. Again, look for that, uh, on that horse, uh, what, 
on, on a laminated horse where, where I've had some success on, on my own horses is getting that hoof to grow and stabilize that coffin bone and uh, uh, get them out of the soft rides. But uh, if you can be, I'd sure want to be somewhere in that upper level on the, the methionine. I'd like to be in that probably six to eight grams a day and the biotin 20 to 25 milligrams. Um, and then you could, you, you, if you had to, you could use just a real good general vitamin and mineral supplement. Uh, and there's, there's quite a few on the market over there. Uh, if you can't find a quality hoof product that, that would contain those, those, uh, the methionine and biotin levels that, that I discussed. And if it had phenylalanine in there, that would be a benefit. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and I would, I'd, I'd sure like to see some of the, the zinc, copper, and manganese, at least, I'd like to see as a proteinate or, or some type of chelate where we take the, an inorganic mineral and we marry that w w uh, with, a, with an organic, uh, either an amino acid or a protein or something along those lines. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Godby, uh, for taking the time to, um, to present this information, present your, uh, your information about uh, nutrition. Um, again, you can learn more about Farnham's products at Farnham.com. If you missed any of this webinar and would like to rewatch it, please visit AmericanFarriers.com before 4 p.m. Eastern Time and you'll find the video there. Before I leave, I'd like to thank each of you for attending and being a part of this webinar. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I hope you join us for our next session. Whether you read the magazine, visit our website, or follow us on Facebook, we'll be sure to share that information with you. Uh, you'll receive a brief email survey later tonight. Uh, please take a moment to share your thoughts with us about that. And with that, I bid you good night. Thank you.